right, so now we're joined by Alain Basak, who's running for City Council Position 9. So go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Alain Basak. I'm running for Seattle City Council Position 9, one of the at-large seats. I'm a resident of the Delridge neighborhood in West Seattle, but I've spent a decade uh, living and working in Queen Anne and in Ballard, so I know your neck of the woods fairly well. Love it and miss it. Um, this is my first time running for elected office, but it is not my first time applying for this very position. A decade ago, before Sally Clark was appointed to the seat she just vacated, uh, I went uh, in front of city council because, well, if you don't apply indefinitely, you don't get it. I thought that I'd be good as a city council person back then. Uh, I didn't really think that I had a shot at it, but the ideas were there. Lots changed in a decade. I've gotten a couple of gray hairs now, and I'm a little rounder around the waist, and I've got a couple of little daughters that are smart and awesome, and I have a PhD in urban planning and a decade worth of experience. The things that haven't changed in that decade are our problems, which only seem to be getting worse, uh, and my solutions for them. I went back and watched my little video from back then, three minutes of speaking to the council, and I'm saying the same things today that I was saying back then. Uh, we need a there there, we need places that have a there there to them. Uh, I would like to see mandatory inclusionary zoning for our city as a solution to affordable housing, and I would like to see it done in a way that keeps everybody whole who's responsible for building our city along with it. I'd like to see a lot of transit so that we can move people around between those places and do that in a way that really helps the folks who run transit and metro do their job rather than reinventing them. Look forward to your questions. Great, thank you. So now we have our four prepared questions. Feel free to flip over the piece of paper. Read on, read along as we uh, uh, read them aloud. And I think Mary, your next, these are two minute answers. Okay. Seattle is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing and rent control and others. What is your approach to keeping Seattle affordable? Thanks. Uh, as I said in my introduction, I would like to say mandatory inclusionary zoning in Seattle. Uh, this is something that is sort of being suggested in New York today under the de Blasio administration. Uh, my version of it would define affordable as affordable to the people making the city's new minimum wage. At the moment, that's $11 an hour. If you do the math, that means you could spend $575 a month for rent, uh, places that are affordable to those people. Uh, by the, the way inclusion era would work is I want one out of five new units in our centers and villages to be affordable to those people in perpetuity, the people making the minimum wage pay to whatever the minimum wage, so as it moves towards 15 and beyond, it would rise with that. Uh, and the, the way we pay for it, the grand bargain that we strike to get this is uh, once in a generation master rezone of the entire city. That is consistent with the comprehensive plan, the update of the comprehensive plan with our county comprehensive plan and our regional plans through Vision 2040 that uh, essentially say that in the places that we want to grow, we really do grow. And I think what it takes to keep everybody whole and to make this happen is somewhere in the ballpark of one and a half times the height of what we have today. So four stories become six, six becomes nine. I'm not talking about towers. It, this is just uh, enough to build the units. Uh, it keeps everybody who's living in single family houses, that's fine. Enjoy living in single family houses in the places where we have good transit service. We will have more people and be able to argue for even better transit service and all of us get to live together in the same places. I think it gives us all the units the mayor says that we need for affordable housing within the next decade. Great job, number two. <clears throat> okay, last year voters approved the levy to fund the Universal Preschool Pilot Program. And after the pilot concludes, how would you fund the full implementation of the program? And what policy changes would you make to ensure this plan addresses educational disparities? Great question. Um, uh, to to yeah. <laughs> Still a great question. Uh, my two daughters are seven and nine. Uh, 
Seattle is the fastest growing big city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth? And what policy changes are necessary to accommodate this growth? of a lot of 
housing growth and they got very much in return for it. Uh, you don't have the transit to support it, so challenges come along with it. I mean, Ballard is exciting and vibrant place that really has all sorts of challenges. Um, I, I think for me the biggest problem we have right now is that people are leaving here and they're leaving here in droves because they can't afford to live here. Um, we need to fix that first and that will help with everything else that comes along with it. We'll be able to argue for the transit improvements that come with it because there will be enough people that go with it. The high tide to some extent does raise all boats if we have people living near our good schools. My kids' school, uh, Pathfinder K-8 in West Seattle, we raised almost $80,000 one night in an auction. Uh, if everybody got to go to a school as nice as mine, public school with parents who want to donate like that, I think we're all better off. That's how we accommodate the growth. Great. So now we'll open up to follow-up questions. These are one-minute answers. People can ask whatever they want. We'll start with Elizabeth. Um, people are upset about the density issue, or the development issues. Everybody kind of knows the density. But how can we, <coughs> what design standards would you implement so that we don't have these gigantic, ugly buildings that are destroying the distinctiveness of our neighborhoods? Because every neighborhood is starting to look the same, because they have the same ugly buildings huge block sunlight as well. So what kind of design standards would you recommend? You know, we've spent too much time uh, with weak design guidelines so that it's entirely appropriate and not regulating building materials, which allow a lot of what you know, you're describing as the uglies to come on up. Those are very useful because they're cheap and fairly weather resistant and do well in our climate. They are hideously ugly for the most part. Um, it, you know, I, I think the real failure in all of this is that 20 years ago we had what most people around the country thought was the greatest neighborhood planning exercise of all time, and we put that together and we got the groups active. Uh, you know, it's part of the reason I lived in Delaware was because there was such an active group down there that convinced me that it was, you know, such a lovely place to be. Um, I don't think there's one answer that's going to fit the whole city. I think the reality is we have to go back and really think about what it is that we want to preserve, what are the things that we find attractive in our own neighborhoods. Um, I, I think in some cases that's going to be not building up, but building more, building back your economy, just thinking about clever things like how to use recycled uh, shipping containers as home, and we're doing better than that. I think if we have better design guidelines and build uh, out but not up within the city, we'll address it a little bit. Okay. <coughs> I was just wondering what you do now. Uh, I do all sorts of things right now. I am, uh, I spend a lot of time hanging out with my Russian friend, Rafa and Pika, and I take my kids to school and pick them up from school. I teach in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. I teach two classes there, one on local communities, the other one on transportation choices. And I spend uh, some part of my day when I'm not out campaigning because I'm fortunate enough to be able to step away from work a little bit to do this. Uh, but I spend a lot of my time at the Ronstadt Center for Real Estate Studies where a uh, think tank within the university were attached to the College of Health Environments. Uh, we have an endowment that pays for a master's program for students. And my work there uh, is to do a few things. We look at affordable housing in the state, uh, we look at parking requirements, and the value of uh, environmentally sound building practices. Evan and Janet, I have one. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, interviewing a lot of candidates and thinking about who we want to endorse. And uh, part of that evaluation is, of course, viability. And you are running a lot large seat, despite the fact that we've moved to districts recently. And uh, maybe that's the 10 candidates or so that are already running in West Seattle. But the, uh, my question would be that, you know, how are you going to fundraise? How are you going to win? And especially in an large seat, we have some knowledge that in, pa in the past, it's gotten to the hundreds of thousands of dollars that it's taken for people to win these at-large seats. Do you have a fundraising plan that's to get you there, you know, given that you are in a race with other people that are also raising a lot of money. <coughs> Could you talk a little bit about that? Of course. Uh, you know, first and foremost, uh, I wouldn't be here. I understand the game. I think it's, you know, we've, we've seen it go to a quarter of a million dollars for a citywide 
Westie. Uh, I am not, not running in West Seattle because it seemed easier to run somewhere else. Uh, I think my issues and the things I care about and where I can be most useful are really citywide issues. Uh, there are some wonderful people running in West Seattle. Uh, I wouldn't be running if I didn't think that I have the ability to do, that, to do this. Um, I spent a decade running bars. I know a lot of people through that. Mm -hmm. I've spent a decade teaching hundreds of students a year, and I know a lot of people through that. I've been very active at both of my children's schools, and I know lots of people through that. My folks have lived here for a long time, and they have a big network. So if we have a big initial network, uh, beyond that, uh, to be perfectly honest, I'm knocking on your door pretty soon. And I fully <laughs> intend to do that. So conventional as wisdom is you're not supposed to do that running citywide, but I'm about to come knocking on your door. <laughs> Great. Janet, and I have one minute. Um, so you've talked and clearly have deep experience in urban planning and development issues. I want to shift the conversation a little bit to human services and ask what do you think are the critical issues in Seattle regarding human services and what would be your priorities? First, well, two things. Uh, first and foremost, I, I hate that we have 10 cities here that participated in the one night count a few more times than I think we should have to do such a thing. Um, and you know, the 10 cities are better than nothing. It's uh, better than the alternative. It's better than burying our heads, but I think it's, uh, it's deplorable that that's the best we can do right now. So I, I think that's the number one crisis that we have. I, I think the, the other one that goes right along uh, with it is uh, slightly more timely help for people uh, in town in, in particular uh, that are new to town that are coming in that the money they have is going to get them just through that into the door if they're lucky enough to rent a place otherwise they're living in their car. So being able to accommodate the folks that come in. So, um, my question, so you, you've given me your experience, you, you have your PhD in urban planning, you, you teach some of the issues you'd be doing on the city council. I'm wondering, this, you clearly would have a, a sort of an academic understanding of a lot of these issues. I'm, I'm wondering from sort of the political side of the job, um, working with your colleagues, doing um, constituent um, um, you know, communication, um, dealing with various interest groups, what, in your experience, sort of would be analogous to um, dealing with the political side of this job? Why, why should you be a city council person as opposed to, um, you know, a think tank on urban sites? Sure. Uh, you know, I haven't mentioned it, but I did spend five years, five years working in the Puget Sound Regional Council. Uh, I worked in the growth management department and in the transportation department. I worked in data systems. Uh, the best thing I did there was working on the regional food policy council. Um, I got to staff a lot of elected officials, uh, and you know, I have a good sense of how it works, uh, you know, certainly on the regional level, but I got to know a lot of our current city council people through that, and I have a fairly good sense of what the job is and the nature of what a legislative position is versus uh, I, I'm not running for mayor, nor am I running for the head of the transportation department. This is a legislative position. The ideas that I'm coming up with from seeing that and learning what these types of positions are, I think are things that council can affect and affect fairly quickly. Great. You did the arithmetic when you were speaking. Uh, I, I recognize you as a housing expert. I'm sure you're familiar with the concept of linkage in Boston sure. in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, I was pretty involved with cooperative housing. and. I would love to see Seattle do something like linkage in Boston in terms of if you're going to build a luxury high rise, you're going to build luxury units, <coughs> then a certain set aside has to be put out for, I like that you're seeing more occupancy, transitional housing, that this tied in directly to the linkage. Is that something that you could see yourself doing, forcing developers to pay a significant amount of money? that would go into uh, to development or transitional housing. It could be a cooperative, it could be non-profit. Yeah. Um, Devils in the details, but yes. Uh, the, the short answer is yes. Uh, the conditions in Boston are very different than ours. They have enabling legislation through their 
state and all of Massachusetts that allows for that. Uh, our state is not so fortunate, so they're, they're not much better climate than we are. Uh, I, I don't, linkage fees could potentially work as we're currently proposing them here. My biggest problem with them is that uh, the affordable housing the units that you're talking about are not required to be in the same building that the money is coming from. And I think that's a mistake. I think we should require units to be in the very same building that's being built and that we can all enjoy the same amenities and uh, take the benefits of the location because otherwise all we end up doing is forcing some people to live far out in some part of town or in our case right now we're forcing people to live in Renton to Cold and Kent to drive in. Uh, so I want those units you know, right there in the building. I think that's what we're missing here. But in principle, I, I don't have a problem with the linkage fees. I think what I'm proposing now is a step further than linkage fees. Uh, and it's really in the form of a just considerably more progressive tax on the rest of it. So we're about out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement.